the Postmodern Realities Podcast, brought to you by the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal. I'm Melanie Cogdill, Managing Editor of the Christian Research Journal. It's October 2023, and this is episode 360, which is a conversation about the book, The Great Dechurching, Who's Leaving, Why Are They Going, and What Will It Take to Bring Them Back, by Jim Davis, Michael Graham, and Ryan P. Burge. Today's guest is Anne Kennedy. She has an MDiv and is the author of Nailed It, 365 Readings for Angry or Worn Out People, and blogs about current events and theological trends at standfirminfaith.com and on her substack called Demotivations with Anne. Anne has written an online summary critique book review for the Christian Research Journal, and her article is called Leaving the Church and Losing Our Religion. You can read her book review for free at our website, equip.org. And it's good to have you on again. It's great to be here. Thank you. Well, as I mentioned in the introduction, we are going to be discussing the book, The Great Dechurching, Who's Leaving, Why Are They Going, and What Will It Take to Bring Them Back? And more than just the book itself, its thesis, it has been covered in major news organizations, and that's I think unusual for an evangelical book with uh, reformed Christian roots with some authors from the gospel coalition. So it's been featured in a series about people leaving the church and leaving religion in the New York times. It's also been featured in the Washington post and maybe other places as well. So I just want to, before we get started digging into some of the various points that they make in the book, just Give us an overview for our listeners. So what's the problem that's taken up by the authors as they see it? And why do you think it's resonating to the degree that they're receiving actual, you know, secular press? Because usually secular uh, press does not feature evangelical books. The problem is a, a big one. And I, I, I really like how they kind of unfold it in the beginning. They, they talk about be, they are located, the two main authors are located in the Orlando area, and they um, they talk about how Orlando was sort of becoming the mecca for big Christian organizations to move from California and I think Colorado. A lot of big organizations were relocating there, including uh, Wycliffe. My, my family is associated with Wycliffe. And they used to have to go to Huntington Beach, but then, you know, over the last 20 years, they had to start going to Orlando and it was just a booming Christian center, it seemed like. And then instead of the whole city becoming Christian or something like that, they began to hear more and more firsthand accounts of people leaving. So a lot of parents would come to them and say, my kids aren't believing anymore. What do I do? Or they would run across people who said, oh, yeah, I used to go to church, but I don't anymore. And so they began to study the question. And uh, they they brought in um, Ryan Burge um, to do some of the academic statistical analysis. But they, uh, they say that over 40 million people have left churches uh, in the last 25 or 30 years. So what's happened is that now more people do not attend church in the United States on a Sunday morning than do attend church. And that's a radical shift because through American life since very early on, of course, with some peaks like during the um, the different revivals that America has um, had, m- the majority of the American population would go to church, whether or not they believed uh, in God or not, they would go. And that peaked in the 70s, and then there was a sort of slow decline. But since the 1990s, uh, people have just left and not come back. And so this huge figure, 40 million, 
uh, was really astonishing to me, but they, um, I, I, I'm sure there's probably not a, a person who does go to church who couldn't vouch for the personal experience of this statistic that a lot of people who used to go to church have just stopped uh, for a variety of reasons. And so their project was to dig into those reasons. Why have people left? Uh, what are the different issues involved? What would it take? That's the question they asked to bring some of them back. And they, they lay it out. Um, they go in the first half of the book, they go through the different groups and the reasons that people leave. And then in the second half, they offer recommendations and kind of lay out what they think it, the church should do to bring the de-churched back. And I, I, I do like the term de-churched uh, because, you know, we've talked a lot about, I have talked a lot about unchurched. You have churched and unchurched. You know, we have people come into our church who are clearly unchurched, as in they don't know what's going on. They, you know, they don't know <laughs> what we're doing here. And you have to church them. You have to acquaint them with what Christian worship is. The de-churched are are different than the unchurched because they do have a sense of what should happen in church. They they were churched, and but now they've left. And so that's a different kind of population, a different question than those who never encountered church in the first place. I'm curious to know how they define the American church. Do they define it across all traditions, including like mainline, evangelical, Protestant, Roman Catholic, Eastern Orthodox? I mean, when they say the American church, is that all kinds of stripes? Because I find that very interesting because especially in the 80s and early 90s and through the 90s, the whole mega church phenomenon was taking place both in mainstream evangelicalism and also in Pentecostalism, where you have these churches that are 5,000, 10,000, 15,000 people. So firstly, you know, how do they describe the American church and, or, or are they only talking about evangelicals? Um, and then what are they saying in the book that has happened to the American church? They, they're, the first part of their analysis did include the entire what, what we could call church, like every kind of church. They say that no church, uh, evangelical, mainline Protestant, Catholic, and then all the other sort of, uh, they don't mention Orthodox, or maybe they do, but uh, not, in a, not in a substantial way. Every Christian body has had a, a substantial number of people leave. The only group that hasn't suffered a major loss is um, the Assemblies of God kind of have come through a little bit unscathed. But I think that they uh, are good at evangelism too, so that might have mitigated against their losses. But they do initially discuss um, every every single church, the Catholics, Protestants, Evangelical, and mainline Protestant. And in the, in the body of their work, they do describe not just evangelicals, but uh, the new term exvangelical, those who were evangelical and who really have left evangelicalism as such. And uh, they, they discuss the idea of a cultural Christian, a Christian, a person who would just sort of go to any church. They don't really know. They don't really know why they're there. Uh, and they, um, they have a mainline person. Um, so in each, in each chapter in the first part of the book, they, they sort of make a composite figure, um, not a real person, but somebody, a little character sketch of what the kind of person is who's left. And the different groups that they they touch on for those composite sketches are, uh, they call them cultural Christians, mainstream evangelicals, exvangelicals, de-churched BIPOC, and then mainline Protestant and Catholic. So probably like Episcopalian, Methodist, uh, non-evangelical churches. So they, they do hit every major group uh and then but then they for the second half especially they concentrate on evangelicals and their recommendations are really focused on that group and not you know they're not really talking to catholics or you know mainstream methodists or, or groups like that so 
what are they saying has happened to the actual church? Is it splintering because of particular reasons or how did they um, come to these, you know, how did they do their research to come to this conclusion that there's been this mass exodus from the Christian church writ large in every tradition? They, they had different uh, sort of, I'm, I'm going to betray my deep ignorance about statistics at this point, but they had three phases of statistical analysis. The first one was of 1,043 American adults who have de-churched. Uh, and this was just sort of to get a basic understanding of, of the kinds of people that are leaving. Um, the second group, 4,099 de-churched, uh, get, got deeper into the the reasons that people were leaving. And so they got into education, um, geographic locations, political politics, ethnicity, age, that kind of information came out in the second phase. And then in the third phase, they had a population size of 2,043 de-churched American adults. And this was more focused on evangelicalism and what what those particular groups um, or the people in that group were the de- the demographics of that group, what exactly, why exactly they were leaving. And so they, the thing that's really astonished a lot of people, including the authors themselves is that it, I don't think anybody has been surprised that more progressive uh, people have left churches what they found this time is that people to the right have left the church, have de-churched. People who would describe themselves as conserv- political conservatives, maybe ideological conservatives, or more to the right. The, that group uh, is leaving in greater numbers. And um, the question of politics did factor in a, a good deal to their work. So it it's... It, there's a there are a fat there's a variety of reasons that people have left. They divide everybody into two categories: those who have left just because they fell out of the habit of going, or they just you know didn't feel like it anymore. But it's they call them the casual dechurched, and then the other group are the the casualties of the church: those who leave because they've been injured, and they 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 are unlikely to return or to go to another evangelical church. So there's a whole lot of reasons that people have left, but they did find certain trends um, emerge as they, as they examine the data. We are able to continue to bring all of this free content to you because we have listeners like you that partner with us in a variety of ways to help keep this podcast and the free content from the Christian Research Journal. No subscription required at all. It's free for everybody. There's absolutely no paywall. But we do appreciate your partnership. And here's how you can partner with us in a couple of ways. One is, I don't know if you missed the episode before this one, but we had an episode featuring a brand new resource called Responding to the Mormon Missionary Message. This is a book that's going to help you have confident conversations with Mormon friends or Mormon missionaries that show up at your door. And it was edited by Corey Miller and Ross Anderson. And we are offering it to you for a gift to the ongoing work of the Christian Research Institute and the Christian Research Journal online. So you can do that by going to our website, equip.org. If you scroll down, you will see a little column of a line of four different resources, and one there is called Responding to the Mormon Missionary Message. If you click on that, you can donate and give us a gift, and for your gift, you will get this book, and you will also be supporting the work of the Christian Research Journal. I also want to highlight another resource in that line of resources on our website, equip.org, and that is a guest that was on our other podcast. I don't know if you listened to the Hank Unplugged podcast with CRI President Hank Hanegraaff, but he recently had on a guest named Carrie Gress, and she has written a very fascinating book. It's called The End of Woman, How Smashing the Patriarchy Has Destroyed Us. And it is absolutely, I think, must reading for men and women. And she really 
does a deep dive into the history of feminism. And this is something of interest to me. And she uncovered some new quotes and some new information that I had never heard of before. I absolutely highly recommend that you listen to Hank's episode with Carrie Gress. She's a wife, a mother, and a philosopher, and she really goes and dismantles the myth of feminism from the very beginning until now. It's fascinating. She talks about feminism as a brand and how the brand has evolved over the years and actually how feminism itself has, you know, in all intents and purposes, murdered biblical womanhood, which is the truth that we find in the word of God about women. So I highly recommend that one. You can also partner with the journal by giving a gift to CRI for that resource. So you will find that in the row of resources along with the book on Mormonism. And you can also support us in the regular ways that I tell you about, which is simply tell a friend. Post one of your favorite episodes of the Postmodern Realities podcast onto your social media accounts or email it or text it to someone. And of course, we would be so grateful if you help us with the algorithm. Go onto Apple Podcasts, write a quick one sentence review about why you continue to listen to the Postmodern Reality Podcast, and it'll help other people find our content. Well, now back to our conversation about people leaving the church with author Ann Kennedy. Well, you've been using various different terms like dechurched, exvangelical. I know another term, I don't know if they use it in the same way as dechurched is deconverted. Um, so how are they exactly defining the faith of the people who have, you know, they put in the category, I guess, of this label they're giving called dechurched? Well, there's a whole lot of theological issues. Um, they found that uh, evangelicals who casually dechurched, who just like, especially during COVID, they stopped going because of shutdowns. But then when churches opened up again, they didn't make it back. They just didn't, you know, they had fallen out of the habit and they have not returned to it. Or they, they mentioned that people, when they move from one location to another, often have a hard time and just don't, that's a, that's a point where people don't go to church anymore and then they mean to but they just forget and then it never happens different sort of life circumstances like that that population they call um strangely orthodox then they're they when they answer the questions about you know is jesus god how is a person saved is the bible the word of god they have high levels of orthodox answers on those like in the 60 percentile range for most of that that the trinity god is trinitarian and that jesus is our savior you have to have faith that those kinds of things um that group is sort of would be they characterize them as being orthodox in their christian faith um uh, i thought it was a little bit ironic because i realized i had some assumptions myself about what it means to be a Christian that I maybe hadn't examined fully. And one of my assumptions about being a Christian is that Christians go to church. So I have thought for the last several weeks, can you call a person who believes all of the doctrines of the church that are, you know, orthodox, like, you know, the divinity of Christ and the Trinity and the resurrection and so on, sort of a Nicene faith, if, if a person holds all of those correct views, but then makes a decision not to go to church, is that person an Orthodox Christian? I've been mulling that over. And um, I think that's something that Christians who do go to church need to think about. What does it mean to be a Christian at that deeper level? Uh, but the, that group is largely still believing in God at least uh, other groups, um, the, especially the the, de, uh, the deconverted and mainline and cultural Christians don't have orthodox views, Christian views. And so it would be harder to get some of those people to return to an orthodox evangelical church. 
tell us about the demographics of some of these people. I mean, I know they've had different labels, but how do they break down some of the data that they have on these people? Because it's, I mean, the numbers that they're giving in the tens of millions do seem staggering. I know it's over, you know, decades, but still that seems like quite a few people deciding that, you know, religion isn't even important enough to practice anymore. Well, the, the, I really do recommend people getting the book if you want to look at the numbers carefully, because I'm, I'm really bad on the numbers question and they break it down, you know, in each chapter, they, they offer the statistics of, you know, when, when people say, uh, well, I'm gonna, um, you know, so they have a lot of really good figures in the, in the book reasons given for uh, why you would go um, and they break it down, you know, by in each group, like mainline Protestant, Catholic, Evangelical, BIPOC, and, and so on. So for example, in each chapter, they, they ask people, what would it take? What do you wish people would do? Or how, how should ch Christians who go to church behave in order for you to go back? And they, you know, like in the BIPOC section, it says that they, 23% of people thought that church going Christians should try to engage more charitably with other viewpoints. That's the kind of statistic that they have throughout the book. So the, the overall, though, most people who, uh, have stopped going, um, especially on the right, um, which is a, an unusual uh, people that was a surprising find, um, felt like the church um, was political or, or either too political or not political enough, that they were not getting this sort of uh, ideological view that they wanted in church. And so many people gave that as a reason to leave. Many more said that they were not having good relationships. So they did not feel connected to church going Christians. And they just didn't want to, you know, they stopped going because they had relational issues with uh, church going members. So th those were two really big ones that are not, you know, of course, then also add to that, a lot of people have left over abuse issues. Um, and then a lot have left over politics, they just didn't, they felt really divided from, you know, whatever church they were going to, they didn't agree. And, uh, and then even more, though, left just because it was inconvenient, or they had other things to do on Sunday morning. So I think that really tracks with what I've heard, you know, in my own community, when people, I when I hear people talking about church, those, the findings in the book do pretty well reflect what I'm hearing people say on the ground about why they would go or not go. So I find that fascinating because those are like personal reasons or political reasons, and they don't seem particularly theological in one sense. So what what is the kind of lens, worldview that the people have that um that are leaving and and how are the authors defining I, I would like to back up a little bit. How are authors defining church? They're just saying this particular building, this particular um place is where people don't belong. Like do they address the theological beliefs about the church, about ecclesiology that these people have, or they didn't ask them that? It doesn't seem like they asked that. In fact, right away from the beginning, when they defined what they, their definition of church, I'm just looking for that right now, but a, a person who they would call churched was, was something that I would I'm if I was going to do a study, which I, of course, don't have time to do. So I'm grateful they did theirs. I would have defined churched probably a little bit differently. So I think that 
they say a churched person would go to church at least once a month. Um, and then somebody who's de-churched would go less than once a year, once a year or less. So not even like Christmas and Easter, they would pick between Christmas or Easter. Uh, and already their definition of, of what it looks like to be churched, I had a, I thought, well, I'm not, I'm not sure if I, I think that, that already shows that there's a big crack in how Americans conceive of the spiritual realm of God and the church. It, because if you can, you know, sort of choose to go once a month, or if you feel like it, that's not an ecclesiology that I think is sustainable, of course. And I don't think it's a very good one either. And I think if that is how evangelicals view church going or what the church is, then it's no wonder that everybody's leaving. <laughs> um, and I wonder, I mean, you know, there have been evangelical movements that have been um, particularly, which makes sense, I guess, during the whole Jesus movement of the 1970s, where the idea of a formal church was like a dead faith. Um, there are people in those movements who think that they would eschew membership as being um, something rigid and not really moved by the spirit. So I'm wondering if some of the maybe leftovers from that time period have crept in because I find that even in higher church um, and confessional kinds of, and you said nobody, even in higher church uh, non-Protestant traditions like the Roman Catholics, people have left too. But I just wonder if there's some kind of disconnect from theologically from people understanding what church is. And I think the average Christian, even if they are in a more confessional tradition, don't have a robust theology of the church. And so for them, church is something that they do. It's something that they, a place that they go. They don't necessarily think, oh, well, when I become a Christian, it's not just me and Jesus. I'm saved into this community. I, and that's what the Bible teaches. I, I just think that there's some disconnect into the meaning of church, perhaps? I think that's exactly right. I think there's a huge disconnect. And the way that the writers discuss the whole issue leans heavily toward that view. Like church is something that you can either choose to do or not choose to do, and it's kind of your choice. It's not an essential part of being uh, having a relationship with God, a personal relationship with God, which I think most evangelicals would say that having a personal relationship with God is essential for faith and that you need to be able to perceive and, and experience that way and that in some real way. Otherwise, you wouldn't probably call yourself a Christian. Uh, I, I, that, that bias is definitely pervades this work. And I think it is one of its biggest problems and a good, good reason why people are leaving churches because, uh, it, it shouldn't, I mean, that's not my ecclesiology. And I, I, I was a little bit surprised. I think I was trying to find out like Catholics, I have a, an obligation, um, to go to, to mass. If they don't go, there's a big problem. They need special permission not to go for some reason. But even that seems like it's been really relaxed, especially, I imagine, through COVID. So the obligation to go to Mass is is not probably what it once was. It's not a matter of salvation at this point. So I I do think there's just a deep um, what's 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 be, what's illuminated both in the book, but just as you examine American culture, what the church is. Uh, what people believe the church to be is not, I would say, what the church is. <laughs> and I think, so when a lot of people have left the church, I'm not exactly sure if they've actually left real churches even. Uh, if you if you leave a mega church because you just didn't remember to go anymore and you didn't really have relationships with anyone and... Um, you just have Jesus in your heart. Like 
that was so anemic to begin with, um, of course, there wouldn't really have been any staying, staying power for you, I would imagine. Uh, whereas if you really, I think if Christians were going, were going to define themselves as Christians um, in the church, their, their conception of a spiritual reality that is unbreakable and essential uh, would have to become a full, full um, and real, not again, I guess, for the first time for this generation. And uh, the, the authors don't articulate anything like that. They are still sort of working off of the paradigm that I think has produced this, this phenomenon of, of the great de-churching. Now, our listeners, um, if you're new to the podcast, you might not know, back in episode 325, Anne and I earlier in the year talked about life in the church and the liturgical church calendar, since Anne is Anglican, and I would refer our listeners back to that because we did have a robust discussion about what is the church and why is a Christian's life connected to the church. I think not just um, various evangelicals' casualness and maybe not having a robust ecclesiology for a variety of cultural reasons and just how the evangelical church developed, really, um, since the 1970s, that people don't like to suggest that your life should revolve around the church is just head scratching to most Christians. Um, we live very um, individualistic lives and I, I don't think that they have any idea about what the Bible calls us to, what it really means in Acts chapter two, to be together in worship, to break bread, to have fellowships, to have the prayers. So it might be a little bit of review if people are long time listeners, but just give kind of an overview of what a biblical ecclesiology is, because I think the average Christian could not really express that in a way that lines up with what scripture teaches. That I think this is the the basic point. And I, my own thinking about this has really changed over the last couple of, well, probably not changed, but deepened over the last couple of years, especially I've read one book, which I really recommend to evangelicals, especially, but it's called, um, Heavenly Participation. It's by Hans Borsma. And uh, I, I, he describes how, uh, um, I think, I'm, I'm, well, it's been a while since I've read the book, but the, the unraveling of a good ecclesiology happened since the, you know, 13 or 1400s. This is a long time coming, so we shouldn't feel bad for not really having a good idea of what the body of Christ is. And one thing that really I think is is really helpful to think about for evangelicals especially is that Jesus's body there's three ways of thinking about it that are that all have to be held together tightly sort of as a bundle that Jesus had an earthly body. He came to earth uh, as our savior in an earthly body that was, um, that, that died and then rose again. And he's in heaven in his body. So when we worship him, we're worshiping a living savior who is spiritually, uh, with us through the Holy spirit. It's not just a gathering, a, a casual gathering of people who feel like talking about the Bible a little bit on Sunday morning, maybe if they have time. We're actually in the presence of a living God and our Savior and in the Holy of Holies, we're, we're worshiping him in spirit and in truth. But then the second part of his body is uh, in like, however you want to conceive of it, you don't have to argue about the actual mechanics or theological issues of the bread and the wine and communion. But most people should, I would say, acknowledge that Jesus, when the bread and the wine are eaten together in a community of, of people who believe, um, that he's with those people in a special way that occurs nowhere else. So people taking communion together, that spiritual fellowship with Jesus and each other is supersedes and goes beyond any other kind of meal 
and is, and is, I would say, essential for Christian worship. You, you just can't leave that piece out. I think that's where evangelicals have just become so weak because the sacramental participation uh, with God and, and his living community has, is not, is very thin and anemic at best if it exists at all. And then the third part, um, which again is just so weak, is that Jesus's Jesus's body um, is the church. He that those three parts together, our communion with each other, our relationships with each other in the church, in a local church, in person, is a mystical spiritual union. Meaning, it's not like hokey pokey or whatever you know, weird esoteric. It's that that Jesus binds us to each other uh, in, in a deep spiritual way that when you break it, the consequences of breaking it are also profound and real. And you usually don't know what they are until it's too late and you've already broken them. Uh, so that kind of Christian community or church is the only making that real and making it again, or for many people for the first time, I would say is the only way to have something to invite the de-churched back into. Um, But that isn't really what people have ever experienced. I think most evangelicals have not really fully experienced what I've just described. And so I think it has been very easy, especially in COVID, for people just to not come back just you know they they were too busy they filled up that day with other more pleasant things because going to church is hard and being with other sinners uh, even just one day a week is really difficult uh, so it just I, I don't think most people have experienced that and so you can't um, it's hard to describe to somebody too who's never experienced that what it would be like if they came you can't really put words around it it has to be something that the Holy Spirit does. And, and then if you really, if you have a community like that and you, and those people have ordered their lives around the church here. So the feasts of the church are central. They make personal sacrifices to be there on major important days. And they make sacrifices for each other to be in service to each other. The bond that is created, the spiritual invisible bond that is created is well, I mean, that's that's what the New Testament is talking about. <laughs> so it's it can't be jettisoned in favor of something else. It, it's the only thing that Christians um, should, you know, find that shapes and orders their lives and everything else sort of comes in around that uh, and, and, and gives meaning, flows out meaning for those other things as well. And I think we've talked about this before in that, you know, I don't put all the, <clears throat> I don't know that the word would be blame, but the responsibility at the feet of all the de-churched, I think part of it has been a lack from the church itself in um, certain traditions or quarters of the church to catechize their people, meaning to teach them about what a biblical ecclesiology is, because the entire New Testament is full of so many commands that you can only do in the community. I mean, we cannot one another, other Christians by our, you know, if there's no other Christians around us. I mean, we have this life together where we're supposed to, you know, rejoice with those who rejoice, weep with those who weep, bear each other's burdens, you know, have unity together, care for one another, um, admonish one another, love one another, bear with one another, um, comfort one another, etc. And we can't do that as an individual solo Christian, which a lot of Christians think that, well, it's just the, my main priority is my relationship with Christ. And I just think that there's been a lack. I mean, it's just my opinion, I, but I just also think there's been a lack of teaching in the church about the church. So in thinking about that, I also want to ask you is like, is this also a generational issue? Because, you know, we are um, called in scripture to pass down 
um, God's commands, Deuteronomy 6, so many places where we're supposed to teach um, the younger generation. And do you feel that there has been, you know, something missing there where, you know, we've said that there's a lack of this teaching have maybe some of the older Christians or different generations not imparted some of this biblical truth, perhaps? I think that's, I think that's a huge part of it. I think the, the great tragedy is that we inherited, well, my generation anyway, inherited the culture of going to church. You know, it was given what I wasn't given a choice of whether to go to church or not. I just, I grew up in a world where people just went to church. And so, um, and I think immense gifts are imparted to people who go to church that God gives his grace to people who go to church in a special and important way. Even if it's difficult to do that, it's often increasingly difficult. But I think at the same time, you know, was I, when I was growing up, I think people were beginning, Christians were beginning to feel the shift under the, you know, the, the plates were moving under our feet as it were the tectonic plates. And I, I do think that many church leaders began to be try to to solve the problem of of what was going on you could see it coming and so you know in many cases it has happened in the the church that my grandparents helped you know i mean they didn't found the church but their lives were poured into the church but um people's you know young people stopped coming and so they took the pews out and they put in coffee tables and they got rid of the organ and they they brought in a band and and then you know funnily enough all those things did nothing at all to bring in people because they couldn't put on a concert that in any way was good enough to to rival that of you know what you could hear uh down the block and a real and a good concert so the church itself many church leaders jettisoned the riches of of sacredness and beauty and uh and also i would say along with that the theological underpinnings because when you change the furniture and you change the liturgy you're you're really changing you're saying something theological about who god is when you do that and the the ramifications of that were not were very ill considered at best and so people began, you know, churchgoers began to not be fed by the churches where they went. The church service stopped being for the churchgoer and started being for the person who wasn't even there and who was never planning to come. And that's, you know, it's a, it's a great irony. It's, it's a nice ploy of the devil. I would say that if he, to get the, to get the pastor to preach to, to the people who aren't there and to scold the people who are um, for not bringing in the people who aren't was, was terrible um, and very effective, I would say, for the gradual killing of of churches. And I, we can see that all over our, you know, all over my town, there's churches that are closing. Uh, and yeah, it said something, it said to both the people who were going and to the people who weren't going, that what was going on here was non-essential, that God wasn't really God, and that we needed a lot of other things, that the, the Bible was not going to be sufficient to help you in your life or bring you to everlasting life. You are going to need something else, um, like a rock concert or something. Those, all those, All those small incremental decisions contributed to the place where we are now and they also show how little faith evangelical leaders had for the actual substance of of the faith that we really should have together that's given to us in the scriptures i think everybody that's involved in church whether it's pastoral staff or church staff or just people who faithfully go have realized there's something happening here because the you know pe people are new people aren't coming at the rate that people are leaving right so there's a net decline so what did the author say in this book about 
um, solutions to bring back the de church because you mentioned just now that some of the maybe methods that started being very popular in the 80s, mid to late 80s, particularly in the mega church movement, um, really didn't measurably, I mean, there were large churches at the time, but it didn't measurably overall increase people coming to church when we look at where the church is now. So what do they suggest that churches do to get the people who left to come back? This is where I I was really frustrated with the, the book, and I, I had a lot of disagreements. I've been kind of roving back and forth over the last part of the book. I think it's the last third, really, where they give advice. But my quibble, if that's what I want to call it, is it starts before that, because I think I even just have sort of philosophical issues with asking people, you know, what, what would it take to bring you back? I mean, I think in one level, obviously that's a good question to ask because if you don't ask the question, you don't know. Um, but just going to people and asking, you know, saying, well, you've left, what, what, what do I have to do to get you to come back? It already just perpetuates the problem. Like I, I think that for de-churched people to come back to church, it, it's very much less going to them and 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 asking and then as they they talk about when one church um went after quote the low hanging fruit so the people who've left but will very easily come back if they just are given an invitation um again i'm not saying that you shouldn't do that i'm just saying the whole posture of the question perpetuates the cycle of leaving i think ultimately because if going to church is a choice, an individual choice that a Christian can either make or not make, then ultimately um, you don't have real churches or you don't have robust enough churches to withstand the coming deluge. So I I just took issue with the question already um, because people are already consumers they're already looking to be pleased. They have found themselves, many people have found themselves to be displeased by the churches that exist and so have stopped coming. And so I don't think it's useful or, or very, very much time should be spent by especially small churches trying to figure out what they need to do differently in order to bring back the people who have left. Um, and that's, that's where most of their advice heads what do churches, what can you as a church goer or what can a church do um, to correct the problem of the de-churched? And they give all kinds of um, sort of, I would say, kind of trendy advice that is felt to me, I've said this elsewhere, like rearranging the um, deck chairs on the Titanic as it's sinking. Uh it's just not helpful. They spend a lot of time um, talking about the sociological paradigm of belonging, behaving, and believing. And most people who have left felt that they didn't belong. And so churches, they feel, should try to work on that relational aspect and, and re-communicate to people who have left that they do belong and, um, and that their belief should welcome them in and that they could be a part of a community. Um, I just, I thought, well, I get, I think a lot of churches are probably already twisting themselves in knots over the various losses that have been suffered since COVID on. And a better strategy would be to concentrate on becoming a, a church, a good church of believing people who really, really, love God and know who he is and have a deep ecclesiology and a, a sacramental understanding of the universe and, um, and proper orderly, beautiful worship of Christ. And then, you know, revisit the question of the de um, would be the way that I would do it. But of course they didn't ask me. So I'm just, you know, here reacting on the sidelines, but, 
I, I, I just think a lot of their, a lot of their advice felt like it's just more of the same. And if we've really had such a massive shift in American culture, we can't just keep doing what's being done now. That's obviously not working. So something new should be tried or rather I would say something very, very old, like let's jettison the last hundred years and go back to what we were doing, you know, from the reformation, maybe around the time of the reformation would be good, but just do that again. It'll probably be fine. So you talked about, you know, churches might, or church staff or um, pastors might be worked up and maybe super discouraged after reading this. I mean, do they give the reader any hope? Like what, what can be done about this? And, and how should, you know, the person in the pew, how, how should they participate in perhaps bringing back the de-churched? One thing that I thought was interesting was it was, I first heard about this book actually through the New York Times and they did a whole set, a series this summer about why people were leaving church and mentioned this book and then um, reading through the comments were fascinating. I mean, people had left church for and religion for a variety of different reasons and I seemed had no intention of ever coming back or felt that it was an archaic thing to do to attend church or believe in God or practice any religion of any kind. I mean, what, what hope is there for <laughs> The person reading this book who, you know, is maybe a professional clergy person. They offer, I mean, the, the main hope they offer is that of the group that casually de-churched who is still Orthodox, over 50% of those people said that they would would definitely come back to church. They would absolutely come back to church. What they need is an, an, an invitation. Uh, and so they really did recommend that people go to people in that group. If you can identify people in that group and just invite them and say, hey, would you like to come to church with me? Most of those people will come back. And that's um, that's the hope. That's the main hope. Uh, and I think it's a good one. Uh, and I agree. Those who have said that they would never go back to an evangelical church, especially like I don't think it's worth um going, you know, you don't need to keep going to those people who've said, I'm never coming back and keep asking them. That's honestly a little bit disrespectful uh, because they've made their, their desires clear. So, and uh, some of those people are willing to go to other kinds of churches like Catholic or, or other mainline churches. So um, I, that's the, the hope the authors offer. I would say that actually, I think there's an immense amount of hope uh, if, if, if I'm right and my idea of church is correct, then the hope is that God is not done with his church. And so he, you know, people are going to, are going to continue to be saved and hear the gospel and come to church. And, and the more that churches can make, can focus deeply on what makes them Christian like the more that that churches can uh, develop really good worship, and by that I don't mean you know a better band, but worship that's more reflective of who God is and is deeper and more profound in its substance, the more the the difference between the church and the world should become sharper, and that's really what you need if the if the de church were ever to come back, I think is for them to see that the church has not been completely assimilated into the world. Because if it has, then you don't need to go on Sunday morning. But if the church is radically different than the world and it's a different place entirely, then you can't get it by going somewhere else. You can't get it by going to the mall or to the golf course, you can only get whatever it is by actually going to church. So I think the hope, and I think churches are already doing this. I, our, our church actually, through COVID, I mean, COVID was terrifying for us, but we didn't lose anybody in COVID. Um, we, 
we actually grew because a lot of churches around us closed uh, or just wouldn't go back in person in a timely way. And so now people drive an immense distance to get to us. On Sunday, we have an hour radius around our church. So people tra- people are so desperate for church, Sunday morning church, that they are willing to drive an hour and stay the entire day. Uh, we've grown a lot, actually. So we've bucked the trend. But I, it's not because we're amazing. You know, we're, it's because we are a real church and we are very different than the world. We, you cannot get the Christian love and the forgiveness and the body of Christ um, that we share on Sunday morning anywhere else except in other small churches around our community. Um, and so there is a sharp distinction between us and the world. And it's really attractive because people are desperate for hope and they need Jesus. They know on many levels that they need Jesus. And so they're willing to travel and make sacrifices and come and spend their whole day in order to share in Christ's body. Uh, and so I'm, I mean, it was interesting reading the book is a exercise in devastation and discouragement. But then, you know, I've been going to my church every Sunday and I, I'm, it's booming. It's so full of life. Um, and we haven't followed any of these recommendations <laughs> that they offer. So um, I, that's just my own personal plug for maybe I'm not even, it's not even your denomination. You don't have to become liturgical or, you know, Anglican or anything like that. I just think you, your, your fellowship that you share together needs to be so bright, so intensely bright and so different than the world that, that it requires anybody who walks by has to stop and look at it and make a real decision one way or the other. You know, you, you're describing a healthy church and there's certainly healthy churches in every tradition and denomination, but you did mention one of the groups of people that left were people that were hurt by the church or experienced some kind of spiritual abuse in the church or other kinds of abuse. I mean, those people are definitely uh, very wary about coming to church. So what would be your encouragement to those people who are like the church I went to before was so toxic. I can't even think of going back to church. I I did like what they said. Um, They had some good advice for people in that group. And they said, um, you don't have to go back to the church that hurt you, or you don't even have to go back to the same kind of church that hurt you. And I think that is really valuable. Uh, I think that people who have been hurt by the church, and I've met some of them personally, um, indeed, I mean, I don't know of anybody who who really participates in church who can't who comes away unscathed because people who go to church are sinners, and so it's impossible to go to church and not be hurt sometimes. Uh, but then some people are are really injured in a deep way, uh, and in those cases, I think it's absolutely true. You should you don't have to go back to the church that hurt you. You do have to forgive that that commandment is is there, but it, that that forgiveness doesn't include necessarily going and spending time with those people again. You can put them in God's hands and let them go and let God work out the results of that. You don't have to keep being re-injured at all. So that's the first thing. Um, and the second thing is I do think, you know, some good cause, this is true for everyone, some caution is in order. Because there are so many churches that are so anemic and in some cases manipulative. And um, as the stats get worse, as more and more people leave, I think more and more churches are, are going to be more and more desperate. And that that can lead people to behave poorly and to try to use um, tactics to get you to stay or to control how you think that are really unhelpful. And you don't have to you don't have to go to a church like that. If your church, if, if you're going to a church that is injurious, it's okay to leave. And it's okay to, I think, if you're really wounded, to take a little break and take a breather um, until you can face it. And then, but then you should definitely still go. You need to find a community of people who really know and love the Lord and are going to be quick to repent of their sins 
and quick to forgive each other and uh, quick to welcome you. And I think those places really do exist because God is still God and they will always exist. Uh, you, they you just might have a harder and harder time finding them if they're in hiding in some places around the world, but they do exist. You can find them. It takes some work, a lot of prayer. And then I would say, uh, submit yourself, to, uh, uh, become vulnerable again to real Christians, uh, because that's where real healing uh, can be found. So just thinking about the healthy churches that are out there, they also might um, have some concerns because, you know, they see a lot of um, people leaving and some of the people leaving very critical of Christianity and the church. And we find ourselves right now in, you know, what I think we would both describe as a post-Christian culture that we live in. In other words, biblical um, a biblical worldview is seen as hateful and wrong. And so how should Christians and the Christian church see itself as it finds itself, you know, in some decline and also in a hostile culture towards Christianity? The the authors talk about, you know, that you need to embrace the idea of living in exile. Uh, and I've heard a lot of arguments about that online that they call it embracing exile and they, I think they offer, again, a pretty superficial view of what it means to live in exile. Uh, I, I just think, I, and I, I didn't find it particularly resonant. Um, I don't think, I can see why some people would react to what they're suggesting. Uh, but there is a sense, I think, what really needs to happen. It's not so much that we live in exile, which we do. Uh, we live in really in Babylon and um, that, that comes with uh, perks and difficulties that many people, many of us would, you know, rather not um, endure, but you do have to remember like every Christian, every church should remember that they are not uh of they are not part of the world they are we are in the world but we uh are only here for a while and this world is fading and passing and it's the spiritual realm that really is going to endure and so the communion and the community that's shared spiritually especially on sunday morning is the thing that's going to last forever And I think just keeping that in mind and realizing that it's being built, it has to be built in every generation slowly and painfully often that that's where, you know, your energy should go and all the stuff in the world is fine, but it's not going to, it's not going to last forever. And so you should spend less time on it. I think just reordering of your view of how, how the cosmos works and who's in charge, you know, is enough. It gets me over that the hurdle every day when I have to go into the world and go to the store and, and wander around uh, my very secular (laughs) community. Uh, I it's, it's easier for me to just remember that God is uh, present even now in our church and it's fine. He, he can, reorganize things the way that he wants to and we don't have to control everything um i do think that the cultural ascendancy that evangelicalism had for so long is a hard thing to give up but i agree with the authors the sooner we let go of that and just concentrate on the work in front of us the happier we'll all be i know that you know some people have gotten to the point of leaving a church that has been toxic that i asked you about earlier but what kind of encouragement can you give for people who say, you know, it's hard to go to church. I mean, it's hard to get my kids there. It's hard to, um, you know, go to church and then maybe do another, you know, youth group in the week or go to a small group or things like that. And I don't, you know, we had this conversation earlier this year when we talked about the church calendar, but, you know, not everyone is like me or sometimes I don't get along with certain people. What encouragement would you give them to persevere, to 
because being in a church with a whole bunch of sinners that you wouldn't naturally be attracted to as a friend outside of your relationship with Christ is not always easy. I would say, I don't know of a time that it is easy. <laughs> like it, it is never easy. Uh, and that's, that's the part, that's a feature. It's not a, a bug The we are, God unites us together um, with people who we would never choose to be with. Um, and that's really hard. I think in a, in a consumer world where you really do get to curate your online life and in many cases your in-person life, it's, it's unfathomable for many people to consider that they would go into a room with a lot of other people who they don't know very well and that God would do something there that united them in ways that they could never fully understand until they go to heaven. That's, that's tough. And uh, I do know, I mean, I personally have often have a hard time going to church. Uh, I have to get all my kids there and I often feel fragile. You know, when you go into the presence of God and you really open yourself up to him, you're going to feel breakable and fallible and fragile. And so it's really hard to do that in the presence of other people and not know whether they're going to accept you or not. Um, and if it's going to be okay. So it is very hard to go to church. Uh, but, and this is a little bit tongue in cheek, but Glennon Doyle, who I disagree with about everything, says all the time, well, we can do hard things. And I think if Glennon Doyle can say we can do hard things, then a Christian who who self-professes to be a Christian and an Orthodox one at that can do the hard thing and go to church to be with other Christians because that's where God organize he that's where you become sanctified it's not out in the world um doing your job and organizing your life the way that you want to it's really in the church that you become sanctified that you are transformed into the image and likeness of christ it's in the difficulty of the relationships that you share with other people in getting hurt and being and having to forgive and hurting someone and then having to be forgiven over and over again that you are made into the likeness of Christ. And so, you know, you can do a hard thing because ultimately it's the thing that gives life. And really you cannot do, you cannot be a Christian on your own without other Christians. You might survive until you die and then go to heaven, but you will not have lived as a Christian. You will not have followed in the way of Jesus. Um, in the full way that's offered to you um, only when you meet with other people who are just as difficult to get along with as you are. So finally, what kind of word of, of hope can you give people after reading this book? They might feel really down, like, you know, tens of millions of people have left the church and they're probably not coming back. And what should we do? Or, you know, you don't want to think about numbers, but how should we grow our church? I mean, is there any hope? I don't know if someone would say that out loud, but just thinking through, I mean, it's a serious issue. I think people need to think about it, but what's a, a word of, you know, hope that you can give to people, especially if they're going to read the book and look at all the statistics in there. I think I mean, I, I'm, I'm hopeful. I think that the first thing is, yeah, I think people should read the book and look at the numbers because it's always better to, to see it on paper and not just feel it swirling around out there. I've it actually felt that it was really helpful to see the numbers and, and, and see that there's real evidence for what I myself have sort of seen going down. And I know other people have as well. So actual evidence is, is always good to get it out of your head or the back of your mind and on, on paper as it were. So I think that's really helpful because also if you don't know what the problem is, you know, what, what are you trying to fix? Um, but then I think the second point of hope is that really it isn't, it isn't our job to fix this. I think, you know, it was, it's really devastating, um, to have a lot of people, especially in the era of COVID just suddenly uh, fall out of the habit of coming and then, and not come anymore. Uh, but I mean, I believe that God arranged the world during COVID. He did that because he wanted to for some reason that I don't understand. 
And I think the sifting that's happened to the church over the last 30 years is a good thing. It's actually a healthy thing um, because I think we've, we've been kind of living on a lot of bad assumptions and uh, a lot of bad trends. We've been, evangelicals have been addicted to fads and, you know, unrealistic ideas about human nature and a lot of just fluff. And this, the, the hopeful thing is that if you find that you have fewer people in your church, that's really, really painful. But ultimately, it means that you have an opportunity to go back to the scriptures and individual small local churches have a chance to recommit themselves and rediscover the treasures of Christ Christianity and the Bible. And I think that's ultimately going to be really attractive. And I think because our world is even more anxious than ever, our country is rife with anxiety and pain. Uh, the Christian message is the only one that brings any true hope. And so I think churches, when they become healthy again, will grow. I, I think that will happen. Well, that's a lot of food for thought about the state of the American church and um, even going to church personally for Christians. So on a much lighter note, we are in October now, and there's many views about Halloween or Reformation Day. So whether you do trick or trunk at your church or whether you go out with your neighbors to get to know them and do Halloween, did your do your kids dress up for that time of year? And what are some of the costumes they've done in the past or are they getting dressed up this year for an event at your church and what are they going to dress up as? We we do have a trunk and treat and we uh, we do usually hit the road afterwards and try to talk to people on the street and um, our kids have traditionally collected as much candy as they can but uh, they have gotten a lot better at their costumes over the years they've um, the best one most recently was I uh, my two sons and their friend uh, dressed up as the Monty Python um, Spanish inquisitors uh, from uh, that sketch, um, you nobody expected the Spanish Inquisition. And that was wonderful because every single place they went to recognized them uh, and were delighted. I just, they just, it was wonderful. Um, most of my girls dress up as literary characters. So we run the gamut of like every Jane Austen heroine and Dorothy Sayers heroines. And those are harder because nobody knows who those people are. So you're always giving a long explanation about who you are in your costume. Uh, so, but it is a great outreach opportunity in our neighborhood. And, um, and I, and the best way I think of for at least teenagers to get dressed is to just rifle through everybody's closets and just put together, you know, something slightly more formal than usual and then slap a fun name on it and you're, and you didn't have to spend, you know, months sewing, which is not something I can do. Well, that sounds like very creative uh, costumes. And so thanks, Anne, for being a guest again on the Postmodern Realities Podcast. Thank you so much for having me. You've been listening to episode 360 of the Postmodern Realities Podcast from the Christian Research Journal. Today's guest was Anne Kennedy, and we've been talking about the new book, The Great Dechurching, Anne has written an online summary critique book review for the Christian Research Journal. Her article is called Leaving the Church and Losing Our Religion. You can read her in-depth review for free on our website, equip.org. Stay connected with the Christian Research Institute and all the new content we have coming your way. The best way to do that is to head on over to our website, equip.org. There you will find thousands of free resources right at your fingertips, from articles to video to audio, and it's all for free. You'll find our podcasts hosted there as well as the Bible Answer Man broadcast, which is hosted by CRI President Hank Canegraaff and streams live every Monday through Friday at 6 p.m. Eastern. In addition, you don't want to miss out on subscribing to Hank Unplugged, which is the podcast of Hank Hanegraaff. And it's in that podcast, he has really in-depth 
free-flowing, essential Christian conversations with some of the most interesting, informative, and inspirational people. And in addition, he has a new series on his podcast feed called Hank Unplugged Shorts, which Hank goes into the headlines in the mainstream media and refutes a lot of those cultural issues that we have in these short podcast episodes. And there's quite a few of them. You won't, don't want to miss out on them. Now, if you want to find some of this at other places where it's all in one place, really subscribe to our YouTube channel. It's a great way to get all of our content there, our podcasts there, and different individual questions theologically that people have that Hank answers at our YouTube channel. Now, you might be thinking to yourself, I don't know how to subscribe to YouTube. I don't have a YouTube account. Well, actually, you might just have a YouTube account. If you have a Gmail address, you have a YouTube account. Just log into YouTube with your Gmail address and search for Bible Answer Man channel and please become one of our subscribers. In addition, if you see that bell icon right there on our front page, please click that. And every time that we have new content, you will receive a notification that new content is up on our channel for you to be able to consume. So thank you so much for the ways in which you partner with the Christian Research Institute. We are grateful for you listening and reading and watching. <laughs>